So please uh, fill us in on this giant uh, Asian species set. What do you what do you commonly call it, and, and and what's new about it? Okay, well, it is a triad of of threats. It's a bad news hornet. It's called the Asian giant hornet or giant Asian hornet, Vespa mandarinia which is Mandarin, the scientific name is Mandarinia. Um, and it's from Japan, and we've known that it's going to maybe come here for a long time, but two times in Canada and three times in, four times in Washington, it's been intercepted. And it's probably come with goods shipped over from Japan. And the reason why it's a hazard is because it is a threat to animals and livestock. So people, livestock, and, and animals, honeybees, and also ecosystems, because it's foreign to our ecosystem. So for humans and animals and livestock, it's, it can sting multiple times and has a very toxic venom. It's more like a snake bite for people. And the problem with uh, it being a problem with ecosystems is it attacks other insects like mantises, other wasps, and a lot of things that are called beneficial insects it can attack, including honeybees. And so the, a lot of worry is around its murderous approach to honeybee hives. That's why I think the New York Times is calling it a, a murder bee. It's really a mass murder wasp. Um, and the, um, the problem is, is that um, with other bees, it goes with honeybees, it only takes 12 or so of these wasps to chop about 30,000 honeybees in one afternoon to chop them up. And what they do is they kill all the adult flying bees from the nest, and then they run away with all the bees larvae that they have hidden in their nest and bring them back to their young and um, it's called uh, that, that that part of their life cycle is only a small part of their life cycle, but they are, um, when they find a honeybee hive, they'll mark it with a hormone to bring in all their sisters to take it out. So when, when one, worker hornet finds a hive with a lot of resources for it to eat, it will mark it with a hormone, a pheromone, and that will cause the other of its same species to come destroy the hive. My, my. So, I mean, so, as if we uh, uh, needed one more thing to worry about these days, uh, this, this, this seems to be a, a quite a potent insect. Uh, first, uh, if you could touch some more on the dangers to humans, how how what kind of history does it have, and what kind of you know dangers have you heard related to humans? Well, from what I understand, in Japan, fifty people a year are killed by this insect, uh, and. The problem with this insect is that even the gear, the personal protective equipment that beekeepers use for beekeeping will not protect a person from this wasp. So we don't even know what personal protective equipment you would use for this wasp. Now, luckily it doesn't come in contact with many people in the wild in Japan, but in the United States, we have a huge beekeeping industry. 500,000 hives come to California every year. And so what our problem would be is in working with those hives, how do people protect themselves? And um, 
The, the problem with them is that they hide underground. They build their nest underground. So an unsuspecting person that wouldn't know where they were could get step on a hive. And that's where the big accidents occur. And that's what makes this difficult to find is because it is underground. The hives are underground, unlike other wasp nests that you might know of that hang in trees. So people um, have to be able to find this hive under underground. And so the good news is that it is way up in Washington at the Canadian border right now. And if you calculate they, the, the wasp might move, if it moved by itself 50 miles a day, it would still take quite a few years to get here. Um, it would take like 20 years for it to get here. However, the way that a lot of these invasive species travel around is in the back of somebody's truck unknowingly or in the packaged goods or something like that. So it ends up traveling here a lot faster than it would normally. Right, and these days, you know, bees because are shipped around as well and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it, can you describe this uh, hornet it, it itself, um, the, the murder hornet, if you will? Um, it, it, it does seem, I mean, just even the expression <laughs> from the pictures we've seen of this hornet may give it kind of a mean demeanor. Um, is it pretty well equipped to survive in the United States? I think it would be able to survive. Um, they haven't done a full risk assessment on it, but I think that a lot of the experts are saying that it would be able to survive because it survives in Japan. And whether it could survive, it really requires a lot of bark and paper to make its nest underground. So I'm not sure if San Diego and the dry climate of California you know, would be able to support it in all, all the microhabitats in California, but they do suspect that it could survive in the United States. And that's why it's such a good big concern for the, the USDA, the USDA and the uh, University of Washington. And um, so, yes, that's why they're worried about it. And hopefully, because you can control it by getting rid of the queen, that if your efforts focus on getting rid of the queen, um, you can get rid of a whole hive with one fell swoop. So, that makes that's the good news is that if you get rid of the queens and focus on that then you the rest of the colony can't survive but the problem is that each new nest might create up to 200 queens so it the in washington yeah so in washington they're having there's six counties along the canadian border where they're having all sorts of people trapped for this uh Hornet, and they use it's 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 a trap that uses rice, wine, vinegar, and orange juice, and it's a trap that doesn't attract honeybees, but it attracts the hornet only, and so people will be able to monitor for it there up in Washington, and believe me. I think they're going to throw a lot of resources at this because it's it is like I said, ecosystem, human, human slash livestock and pets threat as well as a threat to honeybees, which are huge. So, I think they're they're really going to try to go after this hornet for sure. We've known about it coming here, but this is the first time that it's actually been found in the United States. And that discovery in the United States was as recent as December. Is that accurate? Yes, it was. It was in late nineteen, yeah, twenty nineteen, late twenty nineteen. And so this year will be the first year that everyone gets involved in trying to eliminate it. And as entomologists, and by, and as entomologists, is that, the, 
is you know does word spread quick pretty quickly were you was san diego officially notified that about this discovery and is everybody now on the lookout for these hornets yes i think we were warned a couple of years ago actually to be on the lookout for these hornets um because we do have a list of things that are most threatening to U.S. agriculture that we, we, we keep a lookout for. So this was one of those things that were on the list. And uh, now when this kind of thing happens, it, it gets a lot of agencies involved, the USDA, the Washington, um, Washington State entomologists, other hornet specialists, everybody comes to aid the problem. Great. And if you could put this in comparison, I think when the, you know, the Africanized honeybees were moving into the area, that was a big concern. Is, is this a, relative to that? Is, is it a lot more of a concern? It is. I think that the limiting factor for Africanized honeybees is that they're, they are desert adapted so they can't overwinter very well like a European honeybee so they can only go so many latitudes north. Now with global change then they might be able to go further north but their habitat is limited to warm places so they are inhabiting the southern regions of the United States. As far as I know this hornet is expected to survive in, because it can overwinter, it can survive in the northern parts of the United States. So they're concerned about it inhabiting all sorts of parts of the United States as opposed to Africanized bees. Africanized bees are not in New York, they're not in Minnesota, they're not in Washington. But as you can see, these are able to survive in Washington. So that's, that is a concern. And, uh, you know, just we, we have a better signal now with you. Just for our viewers, can you recap the potency and danger of this hornet? Okay, so the hornet has a venom in it that is stronger than a bee, and it can sting multiple times. And the volume that it injects is higher and greater than a bee. So it, it can really send somebody into anaphylactic shock much faster than a single bee sting or, or our native wasp stings. So people who are allergic would have much greater issue. And that's why 50 people in Japan die every year from unintended contact with this hornet. It, it lives underground, so people can accidentally, if it lived underground in San Diego, people would accidentally have maybe step on it if it was able to live underground here. It's more like a snake bite, uh, a poisonous snake bite than a regular bee sting or a hornet sting. Now, the reason why it's so bad is it has both the stinger on one end and it has the huge mandibles on its front end. Nobody would ever see, have seen anything like this hornet. It is huge. It's a one and a half inches to two inches large with a huge yellow head. And on that head, it has huge mandibles. And that's why it's able to snip the honeybees right in half. It just is like a, uh, one of those knights with a sword but they use their mandibles to just cut down bee after bee after bee after bee. It only takes 12 of those hornets to kill a whole honey beehive of 30,000 to 60,000 bees. One afternoon, after one, honey, one hornet finds a honey bee, it marks the hive and their friends come in and annihilate the hive during that season. It's called the um, slaughter and occupation phase. So they're really mass murder hornets, not just murder hornets, mass murder hornets. 
but if they're not here in San Diego, they have a long way to come, and there's a lot of effort being put on annihilating these. They will, unless there was a reintroduction into our local area, it would take many years for them to be able to fly all the way down to San Diego. So we're more, right now, San Diego's local concern is, is you don't need to worry about them. Of course, if anybody sees anything that they don't recognize, that's a large insect with a big yellow head, they should contact the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, the county, or the State Department of Agriculture, or the USDA, if they have any concerns. Because our, our residents are excellent uh, observing, observing people for determining what is in our environment. And a lot of times they bring invasive species to our attention. So we count on our residents to point out new insects in our environment because they're the ones out there, eyes and ears out there. So they can contact their Department of Agriculture anytime they see something strange like that. 